Good day, and welcome to our webcast on IIoT-enabled predictive maintenance, brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by Deskcase, Festo, and HID. Today we'll be joined by Mohammed Abuwali, Managing Partner at IOTCO. I'm Kevin Parker, an editor with CFE Media and Technology. Today's presentation can provide continuing education credits. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RESET at RESET.net. A certificate of completion will be available for each participant to download upon successful completion of a test at the end of the presentation. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RESA. To take the learning unit exam, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a separate browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. Recent research indicates increasing efforts to use industrial Internet of Things technologies for predictive and prescriptive maintenance practices. But how quickly is willingness turning into best practices? Survey of respondents do confirm that companies will be executing condition-based monitoring in the coming years. Stay tuned to today's webcast to learn more about predictive maintenance, including basic technologies, best practices, and case user examples. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you experience issues with the slides or audio, refresh the browser or click the Refresh Media button. Control the volume on this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or the webcast platform. For technical problems with audio or slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of the screen, and if a technician is needed, type a message in the Ask a Question box. The Ask a Question box is also used to ask questions of our speakers. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. This webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll send you an email message within a week with a direct link to the webcast archive. The exam will be posted on CFE Media websites with the on-demand version of this webcast. The exam is for one RESEP ASIC Certified Professional Development Hour. Before beginning the presentation, we invite you to view the following short videos provided by today's sponsors. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned. Your manufacturing line runs like a well-oiled machine because, well, it's made up of well-oiled machines. But what happens when they aren't oiled so, well, well, they break down. Did you know that when oil arrives at your facility, it's already been contaminated with dirt particles and water? And that a particle as small as five microns can bring your manufacturing floor to a screaming halt? Five microns! That's one-tenth the size of a human hair. Gas cases wide range of products filter out these pesky particles and moisture, keeping oil clean from the moment it arrives and is stored at your facility, during transfer and handling, and while in use on your equipment. This means more uptime on your factory floor and less spending on oil and machine repair. No matter your industry, Deskcase has a solution for you. Discover the value Deskcase brings to your manufacturing process by visiting our website today. You already know that real-time predictive maintenance is the best way to monitor the health of industrial equipment and prevent unplanned downtime, but that can be expensive. 
Did you know that with HID condition monitoring, you can afford to monitor all essential systems in the manufacturing process? Don't stop at just expensive equipment. Protect your entire workflow with HID beacons on every machine. All with easy deployment, real-time analytics, and machine learning. See how your business can avoid costly failures with HID condition monitoring. Because isn't every asset in your business mission critical? Welcome back. Before turning to Mo's presentation, I'd like to share with you some research, recent analyst research on the topic of predictive maintenance. Advances in predictive maintenance aren't binary, but rather a continuum. And what you see before you now are the rather tepid conclusions of a plant engineering survey of his readership taken in 2018. The average facility in which the respondents works were more than 400,000 square feet, with more than 20% of respondents in facilities larger than 1 million square feet. The average facility had 29 technicians, including electrical, mechanical, and plumbing, and 32% said they employed more than 40 technicians. 100% of these respondents said that they practice predictive maintenance in their operations. However, the top practices were oil analysis, thermal imaging, and vibration testing, which isn't really the kind of predictive maintenance that's the topic of our uh, webinar today, where we're talking more about uh, predictive maintenance achieved by means of condition monitoring and um, IIoT uh, technologies. In a more recent survey, engineers and managers with an average of 23 years of experience, of which 41% said that their facility made use of predictive maintenance using analytics tools, and 22% they said they performed reliability-centered maintenance using operational data analysis. Nearly half said that they had plans to decrease unscheduled downtime by changing their maintenance strategy. This is an even earlier study done by the University of Tennessee Reliability and Maintainability Center, uh, one conducted in 1991 and one conducted in um, uh, 2008. And I think what's interesting about it is that it had predictive maintenance at about 13% and actually saw a drop in the perceived value of predictive maintenance uh, between those two time periods. Here's a good, very recent survey done by Interact Analysis that predicted the following. They said that by 2024, the market for predictive maintenance in motor-driven systems will equal nearly a billion dollars. Uh, and Given the enhanced demand for remote monitoring because of COVID-19, there will be no slowdown in market growth. Software as a service is likely to be the main business model for provision of predictive maintenance, and it eases concerns over data ownership. The manufacturing sector is propelled by the emergence of smart sensors able to monitor crucial parts of a motor-driven system not covered by legacy maintenance devices and methods. Advanced smart sensors will allow delivery of viable cloud-based predictive maintenance service packages. Smart sensor technology coupled with IIoT gives component managers and OEM machine builders, there are always those two aspects to the market, the scope to offer end users an anticipatory service package. The logic business model, again, will be software as a service. Finally, I would mention that the fall in price of 
uh, microelectromechanic systems or MEMS found in smart sensors will be one driver of this market. Smart sensors, which typically monitor sound, temperature, and vibration, may not provide the depth of data offered by some legacy devices, but they have advantages. Whereas most legacy devices are attached to motors, interact analysis that predicts that only 53% of smart sensors will be attached to motors by 2024. The rest will be attached to other machine components, which are also subject to the wear and tear of daily use. This means that the application of predictive maintenance will be more widespread in the factories of the future. Modern predictive maintenance technology is currently at the beginning of an exponential growth trajectory. Now is an important time than ever for suppliers and users to understand key trends at play so they may work at carving out their use of the technology. Forecast to be more than 1 billion by 2024. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Mo Abuali. Mo is a manage, is managing partner and chief evangelist with IOTCO located in the Cincinnati area. IOTCO helps clients create a competitive advantage through digital transformation. In addition, Mo is adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Engineering and Applied Science. Mo has a doctorate in the philosophy of industrial engineering from the University of Cincinnati. Thanks so much for joining us today, Mo. Please go ahead, the floor is yours. Hey, Kevin, thank you very much for the opportunity to have me here today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to present at CFE Media Events. Um, I'm here with the, in, with the Internet of Things company, IOTCO, and uh, my presentation today uh, will go a little bit deeper uh, with regards to an education on uh, a zero downtime vision for manufacturing, uh, which is powered by uh, technologies like predictive maintenance. Uh, very briefly, um, if, if you don't know about us, you know, please connect with us on uh, LinkedIn or social media. Uh, we are a digital transformation organization uh, focusing on making predictive analytics uh, happen in the manufacturing sector. Uh, many of the case studies I'll share with you all today, you know, they come from uh, automotive, aerospace, and discrete manufacturing. And we have an academy as part of IoT Co. We, we partner with industries and we partner with universities to actually uh, spread knowledge around predictive analytics, IoT, and, and other relevant topics. Uh, so again, really, really glad to be here giving this education today. And I, I've uh, set up my presentation in three areas. Um, I'll first uh, give some definitions around predictive maintenance. Um, I'd like to discuss some relevant case studies for implementing uh, PDM solutions in the manufacturing sector. Uh, but, but in all honesty, the use cases I will show uh, may also uh, be implemented in, in non-manufacturing sectors. So you're gonna see that you know, the, the vision, the technology, the architecture uh, could also be a, a cross-industry type of implementation for predictive maintenance. So let's start. Um, I think it's it's good to first have a, an umbrella view, a 35,000 foot view of where predictive analytics um, is, is actually realized today. And if we look at the industry as a whole and the field of the Internet of Things, right, uh, IoT is, is by no means a new field. I mean, for, for decades, uh, organizations have been monitoring assets and components especially safety critical industries like power generation, aviation, you know, jet engines flying in the sky, right? So IoT has, has been there, but in recent years, the adoption of IoT in the manufacturing sector has really been booming. And, and this is attributed to you know, faster computational speeds, uh, cheaper sensors, cheaper hardware, uh, the cloud and, and other evolutions that uh, uh, Kevin uh, started to allude to in, in his introduction. And when we look at the industrial IoT, the industrial IoT within an operation um, usually conforms to the automation pyramid, which, which is based on the ISA 95 standard. So you have your machines, you have your CNCs, your sensors, your PLC layer. That's your level zero, level one, as they call it. Then your level two, that's your SCADA system. That's your supervisory control and data acquisition, right? Um, these are data being collected from the factory floor. 
they may be collected uh, uh, through OPC historians. They may be collected through uh, solutions like Ignition or uh, or OSI Soft, right? Um, and then you have your business layer. You have your ERP systems, and in some situations, you have a manufacturing execution system or even an IoT platform that is kind of uh, gluing these layers together and removing silos, which are usually the information technology and the operational technology silos within the manufacturing floor. So when, when it comes to predictive analytics or predictive maintenance, I mean, that is a key technology today that is driving the IIoT adoption and realization in manufacturing. And it is also supporting the Industry 4.0 strategy, which was initially a German-born strategy um, and under different namings in different parts of the world. In the United States, for example, the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM, they refer to it as Manufacturing 4.0, as an example. But when we look at a digital transformation strategy right here at the bottom um, and how predictive analytics should be implemented in a real-life setting, we usually take four things into consideration, okay? It's a, it's a four-pronged strategy. And I like to usually from the right and count backwards. I like to start by thinking of the ROI. What is the return on investment to the organization by implementing IoT-enabled and artificial intelligence-based advanced analytics uh, in, on the factory floor uh, in your environment? So it's important to understand the business case, and I, I'd like to start with that. And then following the business case, we'll talk about what is the need for connectivity? Uh, what type of data should be captured depending on the problem I'm trying to solve and depending on the type of equipment, the type of asset, and the process. And then we go into the analytics itself, applying machine learning, artificial intelligence-based mathematics and statistics on the raw data and converting that data into meaningful information and, and predictive insights of machine health and predictions which can drive the maintenance organization to, to realize the business case from the analytics. And then last but not least, there's a philosophy of thinking big and starting small and scaling fast. So with the success of a pilot, when you scale the technology, what do I need to think about? You know, my architecture, uh, edge-based analytics, my data collection per site, how do I scale a, a, a pilot cell in one plant to an enterprise that has 100 cells in 10 manufacturing plants, for example, okay? So starting from the top, the IoT vision, going into the industrial IoT, focusing on, on manufacturing and industry. Industry 4.0, that is the initiative driving all this. And then the four-pronged strategy that we need to keep in mind when we're implementing a tool like predictive maintenance on the factory floor. So let's start with the business case. Um, the vision here is using advanced analytics to drive a zero downtime, zero defect operation, okay? So that's the mentality. And when we're looking at the use of AI and predictive maintenance, um, in many cases, the OEE metric, the overall equipment effectiveness metric, is a key metric used to judge performance and track performance of manufacturing operations today. And the success of a predictive maintenance project should tie back to improvements in OEE, okay? So OEE is availability, performance, and quality. Availability is the uptime in your plan, okay? The real-time data coming from the machine will tell you, is this machine truly running, making parts, okay? Or is it down for some reason? And performance is the speed of your operations, the speed that you're actually making your parts. And then quality is your yield minus a scrap, right? So surveys of customers that are implementing AI and predictive maintenance today are demonstrating um, gains in OEE. They're demonstrating improvements in labor productivity because now my maintenance organization is enabled with insights on how the machine is performing and when the machine is going to fail before it actually fails which is allowing me to improve my labor productivity. It's allowing me to schedule maintenance labor at the right time, at the right place, and move away from a fail and fix maintenance mentality 
to a predict and prevent maintenance mode of operation. Okay. So we're seeing a focus on improving the availability metric of OE and reducing uh, unplanned downtime. And I, I think it's important to also understand that many plants today are running at high levels of OEE. When I personally had projects working with Toyota around 15 years ago in the automotive industry, Toyota was running OEE of lines at over 95%. But one minute of unplanned downtime on a Toyota line meant you are not making a car. And one minute was almost $10,000 of unplanned downtime in terms of hard dollar cost that is lost to the business. So if I'm able to mitigate 1% utilization or, or sustain that 95% OEE running on my lines, I, I have surely been able to start demonstrating ROI for my predictive maintenance project. So my, my message here is it's not just about improving OEE, but it's about using analytics to sustain a level of OEE and to mitigate unplanned downtime. I also want to comment about integrating predictive systems with your maintenance or spare part systems. In many cases, the predictive maintenance systems can run standalone, but in other cases, you can, you can gain a lot of win from integrating the predictive system into your CMMS, your computerized maintenance management system, or your EAM, your enterprise asset management system like a, an SAP PM or an Infor EAM, IBM Maximo type of solution, because these solutions are usually um, not connected to the factory floor. And if, if I know that a machine is going to fail and I know the spare part requirement and which part of the machine is going to fail, that is very useful information to send to my CMMS system so I can make proactive decisions on spare part needs and maintenance scheduling needs, right? So as you may be aware, there are maintenance-related metrics like mean time to repair, MTTR, and mean time between failures, MTBF. And those are key metrics uh, with which predictive maintenance can, can provide uh, support and improvement. Not to mention that uh, many, many users of predictive maintenance have gotten to the point where they've actually eliminated the need for overtime maintenance, okay? you don't need to do maintenance ad hocly on the weekend anymore because something has failed. You have data collected, you have predictive insights using AI, and you can optimize your maintenance schedule in a very timely fashion. So now that we have the business case aside, I, I want to put forth some definitions, okay? Um, it, it's important to understand the roots of predictive maintenance. So, you know, maintenance strategies are, have really evolved over the years. And it's important to understand where you are on the maintenance maturity curve, right? Every organization is different. Even if you go in a manufacturing plant, you know, different areas of a manufacturing plant may actually have different levels of maintenance maturity, okay? And at the lowest level of the maintenance maturity curve is simply reactive maintenance, okay? There is no analytics. There is no sensors. I got a lot of spare parts waiting in my warehouse for something to fail so I can, you know, hastily fix it before it actually goes down, right, or after it goes down. So reactive maintenance is a fail and fix, and in, in many cases, unfortunately, it's a firefighting mode of operation. And then comes preventive maintenance where, you know, folks have invested in solutions and approaches to actually create a PM cycle. So there isn't really any data collection here, but there are approaches of knowing that I need to run my motor for 5,000 cycles and then I fix it, for example, right? Based on the, the, the knowledge of the part or the component or working with the machine OEM. So it's good to have a PM process in place. And it's actually a must because a predictive maintenance system is not gonna help you catch everything. You know, it is a myth if, if folks are deploying predictive maintenance and thinking, oh, that's gonna solve all my problems. Actually, predictive maintenance can, can solve some problems, and other problems will be addressed using your regular preventive maintenance cycle that you should continue running on your machine, okay? And I'll show an example later on industrial robots and how there are PMs that are required, but at the same time, predictive maintenance can help alleviate some concerns. So predictive maintenance is a is the level up from your standard condition-based maintenance where you are starting to collect some data, right? It is actually using advanced analytics 
it has taken a wealth of information that is coming, not just from the machine, but from the process, from historical data available, from maintenance records that might, you yeah, might have, and also incorporating domain knowledge of experts to support you to improve predictions of when these assets are actually going to fail and what is the diagnostics of the root cause of that failure. So if you do a search around predictive maintenance, you're going to find some, some, some hot items there, a lot of buzzwords. Okay, The top words would be uh, using the cloud, uh, industry 4.0 technology, there's big data. There's a lot of data being captured. Um, intelligent machines. Some machines are becoming more intelligent than others. Machines are providing data right out of their CMCs and PLCs, your Siemens and Adam Bradleys and so on, right? Um, sensors. You know, do I need to use a sensor? When do I need to use a vibration sensor on my spindle bearing? Or can I just use, you know, machine controller data to do what I need to do without the need for add-on sensors, right? These are all questions and common concerns, frequently asked questions, FAQs, I would say, regarding predictive maintenance. But first, we need to understand, again, what is the business case? What does predictive maintenance really mean to my organization? What is my maturity scale of, of doing maintenance today within my organization? And then using that to drive the actual predictive maintenance strategy for, for my company. And I personally like this definition. Um, you know, PDM is truly about predicting future asset failures, and it's very important to keep this here in mind that you're combining big data from the technical condition, the usage of the asset, potentially ambient or environmental conditions surrounding the asset. Maintenance history is important. It's good to understand past events that have occurred because you can start to create signatures around those events. Um, it's not just about collecting data now and then, you know, trending data for the future. If there is historical data that indicates that a bearing failed due to an inner race of my bearing failing or an axis on my robot failed due to the axis having a, a, a backlash on my motor, for example, that is very useful labeled information. And those labels of, of maintenance uh, concerns and issues are key to improving the accuracy of predictive models. So how can we do it, right? Um, a, a very simple blueprint for predictive maintenance is, is really a six-step process on a strategic level, right? The first step is, you know, hey, what is your strategy? What are you trying to achieve? What is your current maturity level around maintenance as a whole, right? What is your three to five-year target? And do I have the right champions on the top floor, right? Um, do I have a, a maintenance organization, a digital steering committee organization, right? A top-down approach is also required to, to have governance around these types of projects. Second is thinking big, starting small. Let's create, you know, pockets of win, right? Initial pilot projects. Sometimes we refer to them as proof-of-value projects. Because a proof of value is a project that has a business case attributed to it. It is not just trial and error concepts on the factory floor. Those are true projects of a technical nature that have a business value attributed to it. And they judge the success of that pilot. Okay, The pilot is deployed. It runs, say, for three months. There is an OEE improvement that's attributed to it. right? And that is my measure of success. So it is a proof of value. And then what capabilities do I need, right? I need to do a lessons learned. What went well? What can be improved? And then understanding, do I have the internal data analytics and digital maintenance organization, you know, to back this up and to use it properly? And then, hey, can I scale this on my own, right? Do I have a, a digital maintenance steer, a center of excellence, sometimes we call it, a COE environment, right? Or do I continue to use my technology partner or vendor to help me do the rollouts? So that requires a new skill set of talent that requires data scientists, for example. So do I have data scientists on staff? Or how do I you know, slowly train them and bring them into my organization? And how can my data scientists you know, work hand in hand with my maintenance organization? Because they surely cannot work in silos. There has to be domain knowledge 
that is transferred collaboratively between the data science organization and the maintenance organization, right? And last but not least, it's important to follow an ecosystem approach, right? Um, it, it's good that some organizations are hiring data scientists and they're doing a lot of the work in-house themselves, but there is so much knowledge out there. There are, you know, technology organizations, universities, uh, National Science Foundation centers, National Association of Manufacturers, um, you know, industry-related focuses, like in the automotive industry, there's AIAG and OASA and so on. So create your digital maintenance ecosystem that allows you to learn more and scale these initiatives in a cost-effective manner. From a technical perspective, predictive maintenance is a six-step approach, okay? The first step is, where do I focus my effort? What are the critical components where I need to focus doing my project? If I look at a factory, there are hundreds of machines, right? Do I need to do predictive maintenance on all my 100 machines? You know, the answer is no. Uh, sometimes the 80-20 rule applies, right? 20% of my assets are giving me 80% of my issues, and that'll be 80% of my ROI right then and there, okay? So identify the critical assets, look at your maintenance records, talk to the domain experts, and there might be robotics, they might be injection molding, there might be other assets where you should focus your effort. And then start collecting data. Have a data collection strategy in place. And it's important to understand what is your data model, okay? What data needs to be captured from the CMCs and the PLCs? Of course, if they are you know, advanced enough to allow you to capture data, um, the older the controllers, the more sensorization is required. But even with the newer machines, uh, in some cases, vibration sensors, for example, are a must, and they must be augmented to the machine to support the predictive analytics project. And I'll show some examples there. Feature extraction, feature selection. So now that I'm collecting data and I have a data collection architecture and strategy in place, what features do I need to extract, right? How can I convert that data into meaningful metrics? Those are statistical metrics, including time domain types of analysis, frequency domain types of analysis, wavelet domain types of analysis, right? So what is the best feature engineering approach to follow based on the type of data that I'm capturing today, okay? And then training your health assessment model that is powered by the right machine learning algorithm that needs to be trained and validated, okay? And um, it, it's important to understand that in some cases you have a, an unsupervised learning approach, which means you only have one condition of data, which is usually your current baseline data, so you don't have history. Um, in other cases, it is a supervised health assessment model where you have historical data, and that historical data is used to train multiple signatures, right? Um, this is a good behavior of the machine. This is a failure mode X, failure mode Y, and, and it's labeled data around multiple uh, variants of the machine performance. So that's your health assessment, but at the end of the day, you need an intuitive way to show that health to the end user, right? Uh, zero to one or zero to 100%, 100% being healthy, and then the machine degrades over time. And once you have baseline data and your machine learning model is properly trained, uh, you have a performance prediction model that is able to start giving you future predictions of what we call the RUL, the remaining useful life, okay? That is a prediction with an accuracy of how many cycles, days, or weeks, or whatever your time period is, you know, you know after which I would hit a warning level or after which I would hit a failure level that would potentially bring that machine down, okay? And it's important to use your AI model to be able to understand those thresholds statistically your warning threshold and your failure threshold. And last but not least, have an intuitive visualization, right? A human machine interface visualization so that the maintenance organization who are not PhDs, they are not data scientists within the manufacturing environment are able to use and trust in the data and the predictions and the insights that are being provided. And the visualizations are friendly enough for them to, to make actionable decisions on the maintenance needs of the organization. There is also, you know, in the notes that you're going to receive, you're going to see some more details of what the sixth step is that I have just verbally explained. 
But now it's important to take the six steps and actually apply it, okay? And this is a great example of a library of templates, okay? And for each one of those template examples here, um, you actually have the six-step process for predictive maintenance pre-built or built in, okay? I mean, these applications, guys, are well-studied, well-thought-out. They've been running for years in industry, okay? So they are not proof-of-concept examples. They are truly proof-of-value examples that have been implemented and well-thought-out well in the literature and are available at your fingertips to start implementing in your organization. That includes industrial robots, and I'll show an example of that. I believe I also have an example on CNC machines. And there is, of course, more. There are advanced manufacturing processes, you know, what I call big data projects, high-pressure die casting. I'm collecting, you know, 40 to 80 process parameters. There's a lot of data coming, and I'm receiving data every few seconds, right? So now data collection strategy is really important there. Injection molding, same situation. You know, I think I have a short example on stamping machines. Um, and also not to forget ancillary components that are surrounding the factory, okay? So you have some compressor or HVAC systems that are controlling uh, a big portion of the plant. And if they have issues and they go down, I mean, this could be catastrophic to the operation. It is, it is severe in the sense that it could bring down a whole line or a whole part of the factory, right? So don't underestimate the critical components within the operation that also are adding value to the operation. So let's look at a few examples, okay? Um, I believe I've prepared two or three use cases, starting with the robotics. Robotics are a perfect example of where you need the right mix of a preventive maintenance strategy and a predictive maintenance strategy running hand in hand, as I've kind of described in the beginning of uh, the presentation. I mean, cable failures and dead batteries and, you know, a few of these things cannot be captured using a predictive maintenance system, okay? So continuing the proper PM cycle for those is crucial to the business. But activities here or events where my downtime cost and impact to the business is high, you know, remember, one minute of downtime at an automotive plant is, you know, $10,000 to $20,000 per minute, okay? That's high impact. That's high cost. But at the same time, frequency of occurrence is not so high. Yeah, because then I have enough data and I have enough uh, bandwidth to actually create proper predictive models, okay, for high-impact events and low-frequency events. This is our recommendation of the best events that are the 80-20 rule, right? Those are the best predictive maintenance use cases for quick wins um, and, and, again, applications that make sense for predictive maintenance. For example, motor brake failures that occur on a six degree of freedom robot. You know, each axis as it's moving, each joint has a bearing within the robot, right? It's important for these applications to address the fact that, you know, you have a variety of asset types, you have a variety of robot manufacturers, you have Banat, you have Denso, you have ABB, you have KUKA, and they have a variety of ages, okay? Some new, some old. But the data model remains the same, okay? We need torque data for each of the axes of the robot. And we need high frequency torque, right? We need angular speed, which shows the motion of the axis. We need the position of the axis. In some cases, we may need the temperature of the axis, right? So it's actually a non-intrusive data collection model where we're capturing data directly from the PLC. But in the age, in, in the older robots, of course, we may not be able to capture data from the PLC and uh, we would be requiring to instrument the robot and capture this data in a more manual fashion. The next step is representing that data to the maintenance organization, um, telling them what is the health of your robotic and when is this robot going to fail before it actually fails using artificial intelligence and machine learning based analytics. And those systems are usually deployed in a, in a multi-step process. So a predictive maintenance system obviously requires, number one, the data model to be in place and data collection to be properly active. And at the, at the bottom here is an example of the data map required for a typical industrial robotic. Um, data needs to be stored, whether it's on-prem or whether it's on a secure cloud. 
and then the data needs to be converted using AI and machine learning into um, you know, accurate health metrics that are showing you the health of the robot as a whole, but also the health of each axis of the robotic. And then going into the predictive monitoring and the, the user experience of the solution, right? Visualizing the solution and also providing what we call predictive alerts. So prior to the failure, sending notifications to the right person at the right time. And, and this is an example, actually, of what such a solution can look like. I mean, this is your health, okay? Each one of those green points is the health metric following the AI being trained and run. And the green is your baseline. You want to be as close as possible to green if you are healthy. Yellow and red are the uh, AI base indicators or thresholds for the warning level and for the failure level. And in, in a case where the, the asset has degraded, we call it a degradation, and you hit the warning level, I mean, there, there is obviously a predictive model that is able to show you here your remaining useful life in pink. And with a prediction accuracy, obviously, plus or minus, right? But what, what, the, what the end user here has is, is the power to understand what is happening to my machine in real time and a prediction of when it's going to fail before it fails. And then at the bottom, pinpointing where on the machine the failure might occur, okay? We call it a diagnostic or a contribution. So rather than me going and fixing all the six axis bearings on my robot, which is usually a standard thing that, that you know, folks in automotive maintenance would do because I don't know what's going to happen or what's going to fail, um, I now can save time, save spare power costs, and actually fix the right area on the machine at the right time. So I have saved time. I have saved the fact that I don't need to replace good parts early. You know, early replacement of good spare parts is a hidden maintenance cost that I can save, right? And, and I can see an accurate indicator of machine health and machine, machine failure. Another example on CNC machines, a much more complex piece of asset, okay? A lot of moving parts, a lot of templates. You've got tools that are in the spindle. You got ball screw and feed axis, which is your linear axis of the CNC machine. You got a coolant system, which uh, the lubricant sometimes actually degrades, and you end up, uh, you know, having a fluid uh, go go through the spindle, which leads to a, a a crash or leads to a bad part being produced. So then the data model here is a bit more elaborate, right? Um, on the spindle, uh, we strongly recommend a vibration sensor. So now I have high frequency data coming in at 20 kilohertz sampling, that's 20,000 samples per second, okay? And that requires a analog digital converter hardware to bring that data into a third party system. And then you have controller data that is used to, you know, segment and normalize the data. For example, the spindle current, the spindle RPM, and the program ID, okay? But on the ball screw or the linear axis of the CNC machine, you actually can do it non-intrusively. You actually can collect and compare the axis position versus the commanded position and use data like speed, load, and program ID to actually start looking at you know, lubrication, starvation, and, and, and crash issues with the linear axis, okay? So in fact, on a CNC machine, there are ways just to use controller data, as in the case of a linear axis or a ball screw, and there are situations where I do need an add-on sensor, like vibration on the spindle or the uh, coolant monitoring sensor uh, on the coolant uh, tank or the lubrication system, okay? So great example here. And then what do I do with the data, right? This is a typical implementation approach for a predictive maintenance system, okay? Um, it's important to understand the multiple layers you have in your factory. It's important to understand you have your machine, where I'm receiving machine data, and there's a variety of protocols like OPC and MT Connect that can be used here. There are some templates where a sensor is required, like vibration or the coolant sensor. There are hardware units that do analog to digital conversion, and then you need to aggregate the data. You need a software that becomes a data aggregator, and in some cases, I'm doing some signal processing and feature engineering here in the aggregator, okay? And in the metadata, like the health, the predictions, and whatnot, 
uh, can be sent to the virtual cloud, which could be the private cloud of the customer, whether that may be AWS, Azure, or others, right? And then there needs to be an AI configuration toolbox where you are able to configure those templates using you know, training data, usually two to four weeks of training data, depending on the model, depending on the template, and then bringing that into the cloud so it could handshake and it would run live with the data aggregator, which is usually sitting in the factory to mitigate any you know, bandwidth uh, and, and data transmission issues. Okay? So typical implementation architecture of a predictive maintenance system you know, from the plant floor asset data to the aggregation layer, which is usually in the plant, to the cloud and the configuration layer. So on a CNC machine, you kind of are receiving your data map here, okay, which is again a mix of sensor-based data, controller-based data. Sometimes you have more sensors depending on the machine and need, right? And then you're converting that data again into an intuitive human machine user experience representation, okay? Again, my maintenance organization are not PhDs and they're not data scientists. They are folks who need not to know the data science but need to trust in the output and use it to drive the business case and improvements from predictive maintenance. And this is actually a spindle bearing example on a CNC machine where you are looking at the health you are looking at a prediction of a typical bearing and how it behaves. Uh, notice that this is a curvy linear or a nonlinear prediction algorithm here. You know, unlike a robot, which uh, degrades in a more linear fashion, it's more repetitive. You know, CNC machines are not, and bearings do not, you know, fail in a linear fashion. They fail in a more nonlinear fashion. And the diagnostic here is actually taking into consideration the bearing geometry, okay? So if I know the type of bearing in the spindle, I can take that geometry or physics information of the bearing, and I can actually go much deeper, and I can look at the harmonics of the bearing failure using the vibration data. In this case, I'm diagnosing a band frequency of, uh, trying to look this up, 8,000 hertz, where the bearing might fail. But there's other frequencies here that I can capture. And I can actually you know, tell the user if I'm having a predicted outer race failure of the bearing or inner race failure of the bearing, just, just as an example. So the analytics can get much granular in this situation. So in closing, um, I think it's important to understand where your organization is in terms of maintenance maturity, okay? It's important to do an assessment, a digital transformation or a maturity assessment, okay? It's important to run a series of meaningful workshops that relate to visiting a select plant, meeting the right team, and then really doing a gap analysis around people, process, and technology, okay? And creating a relevant statement of work for a predictive maintenance proof of value. This proof of value has a business case attributed to it, and this proof of value can be deployed. Usually it runs for about eight to 12 weeks, two to three months, in which results must be achieved, okay? If proof of values are running for three to six months and being extended, I would, uh, uh, you know, humbly recommend immediately shutting them down and re-strategizing, okay? If the people process technology uh, layers of a proof of value are properly done and properly spec'd, you know, the solution should start delivering ROI to the organization within two to three months. And then scalability. Um, and thinking of the talent needed to actually make the scale happen. So in conclusion, a thinking big, starting small, acting now mentality is crucial to the success of Industry 4.0 technologies and predictive maintenance in a factory. Um, you know, make things operational with a proof of value that has clear alignment between the technology and the business. Whether you run a factory or whether you make a product that you sensorize out in the field, the analytics are actually similar. Whether I have a bearing on my CNC machine or my bearing is running in the field somewhere in a machine that I own, right? Whether you have a smart connected factory or a smart connected product strategy, consider the right analytics to achieve the business case, keeping in mind a zero downtime, zero defect vision of operation and improving customer satisfaction. And my advice will always be 
do your maturity assessment, find your weak link, and it's usually around people, process, technology. Make sure you mitigate that prior to embarking and, and, and doing the implementation, and uh, you know, rest assured you'll be very successful in the results. So thanks again, CFE Media, for the opportunity, and I'll hand this back to you, uh, Kevin, to take over. Well, thanks a lot, Mo, but don't go away. We've got questions from our audience, and I would um, uh, urge the audience to send us their questions now. Uh, we'll get to as many as time allows. Questions that we don't get today will be posted online. Um, and remember to download your certificate of completion. Uh, Mo, uh, a couple of qu people have asked questions about brownfield versus uh, uh, greenfield um, implementations. And um, my impression is that in North America, at least, the predominance of IIoT predictive maintenance implementations are in brownfield uh, facilities, simply for the fact that there's not that many new facilities being built. Uh, I mean, if you're an OEM and you're putting it in your equipment, that is, in a sense, a green field. Uh, but uh, what considerations does uh, a management need to take into consideration before embarking on, you know, kind of retrofitting IIoT and sensors into an operation, operating um, enterprise? Yeah, that's a great question, Kevin. And there, there surely um, are approaches to uh, to do a digital assessment and really do an audit around connectivity for the factory floor. Uh, with, green, with the brownfield operations, you know, connectivity could get more and more uh, cumbersome due to the age of equipment and uh, variants of equipment uh, all over the place. So our strong recommendation is always, you know, do an audit, do a machine readiness assessment, um, understand what you have on the plant floor, understand, you know, connectable, if I may say, um, if they are not IoT enabled, if they don't have Ethernet ports, you know, how can I get data out of those machines using gateway hardware of some sort where I would instrument the machine? So I think connectivity is a key player here uh, versus greenfield sites where machines are usually newer when they arrive and you can interact with the system integrators, you know, prior to the machine even coming to the factory to make sure they're ready with all the bells and whistles so they can kind of talk to the outside world. So I see that as, a big, uh, as a big issue. Good, I appreciate it, Mo. Um, now, kind of connected to that question is this one. Um, you have to have that means the connectivity to move forward. What other kinds of infrastructure is needed uh, in a large facility if you're going to uh, uh, implement one of these programs? Yeah, I think there's always a big question on the networking and the network architecture. Um, you know, obviously there are network drops that need to be placed near machines at the right place. Um, there are potential add-on sensors like the vibration I mentioned that need to be instrumented and also networked. Then when it becomes uh, more regulatory uh, type of industries like aerospace or medical, there is a need to segregate the network in a way so you can have a DMZ zone, like a demilitarized zone versus an isolated machine network zone versus a corporate IT zone. So I think the networking infrastructure and the network architecture and topology are key conversations that are usually, you know, uh, what, what's a good word, uh, long duration tasks within uh, a predictive maintenance implementation. Mm, good. Uh, you mentioned integrating with the EAM system, and it's certainly clear to me in recent months that you know when it comes to enterprise asset management the data management function is key because you've got such a wide disparity of information um, being resident there and if you want to drill down into equipment specifics etc um, on the other hand i think of uh, IIoT based uh, predictive maintenance is being real time and almost more closely related to uh, the control function. So what is the nature of, is it that aggregation that you talked about? Is that the level on which um, the predictive maintenance system interacts with the EAM system? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
I think there are some mission critical applications for predictive maintenance where where I'm actually using the predictive insights to to actually provide prescriptive analytics and potentially feed data back to the machine to make a change in the uh, recipe or to even command the machine to do a different type of operation. So in those mm. mission critical implementations of PDM, there is a necessity to have more analytics on the edge. In other words, on the aggregation layer that's in the plant because decisions have to be made within uh, split seconds. Um, but there are applications of predictive maintenance where you know my spindle bearing it will take a few days or a few weeks to fail. It is not mission critical. So in this case, you can have less on the aggregation layer, but more on the cloud and storage layer where the decision making uh, would, would be performed. Good. Um, when I hear about IIoT projects in general or analytics in general, um, I'm often told that the critical stage is that leap from the pilot to production. And a lot of it um, gets kind of ends up getting stuck in that, that piloting stage and never goes beyond that. Is that your impression also? And, and if so, what do you think are the keys to uh, avoiding that, that challenge? Yeah, I tell you, Kevin, they even made up a name for it. They call it pilot purgatory. And uh, right. some folks are unfortunately stuck in pilot purgatory and they, you know, extend the pilot and maybe shift it to other machines and they think that's going to work. Um, but my view is it's, it's all about the setup. If, if the projects are set up from the onset in a better way, and if a gap analysis was properly performed around the maturity of the people, the process, and the technology, I believe the implementation would be, would be hugely successful. Um, my take is it's usually not the technology. It's usually the, the, the people, the culture, the change management side of it, and, act, and the actual you know, having the technology integrate into the daily lives of the user. Um, if the technology becomes integrated and entrenched in the way the maintenance organization actually do their daily job, it would yield favorable results and it would lead favorable results in a very short period of time. Good. A uh, final question for today, Mo. Um, I sometimes edit a magazine called Oil and Gas Engineering and have uh, occasion to travel in Houston and down there I you know, had an opportunity to ask some compressor providers and some other OEM equipment uh, manufacturers what their plans were for IIoT. Now, this is some months back, but uh, amongst some of them, there was a real hesitation to invest even a couple of hundred dollars into mm -hmm. putting the sensors on their equipment and other, you know, maybe some compute availability capability, because even an increase of $100 would mean that they were drawn into a price compet competition mm -hmm. with um, uh, their competitors. Uh, do you find that to be the case, or do you think that it's, it's inevitable, and will it be quick that machines and equipment are um, equipped with their own sensors and computing capabilities? Yeah, it's, it's a good point, um, and I think it's surely application-specific, industry-specific, but most importantly, it is business case-centric. Um, I'm seeing more and more new generations of machines in the automotive and the aerospace industry that are coming with embedded sensors, uh, like embedded vibration sensors in the spindle, for example. Um, but, but, but in all honesty, when it comes to the oil and gas, you know, I'm seeing two variants. I'm seeing folks with the great example you mentioned that are, are, are you know, risk averse and not willing to add sensorization, maybe because they don't see the business case formulated properly. But I'm also seeing others who have over instrumented and they're only using like 5% of the data they've captured and there's the other 95% where they're doing absolutely nothing with. So, you know, I, I think um, a, a blueprint for a successful predictive maintenance project requires um, the right sensors and the right data at the right place at the right time. You know, you don't need to over-sensorize. You don't need to under-sensorize. There is a, 
uh, there's a right recipe for the data map, and that data map allows you to drive a business case forward, which, which justifies your investment. Well, great. That's a great conclusion to our presentation or your presentation. I want to thank you so much for the detailed, uh, technology-rich uh, uh, presentation that you gave, and I want to thank uh, our listeners also for their great uh, questions. I'd also like to expend, extend special thanks to our sponsors, Deskcase, Festo, and HID for sponsoring today's event. And now that we're just about done, we'd like to hear how we did. Uh, the exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Plant Engineering, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Kevin.